You're listening to Life Repair Recovery Talk Radio with Rick Thompson only on L.A. Talk Radio. Hello, welcome to Life Repair Recovery Talk Radio. I am your host, Rick Thompson. This show is about sobriety and recovery. Each week, we discuss a different topic relating to addiction with the aim that you can gain some insight, guidance, and hope from our discussions. We focus the show in three different segments. One, the viewpoint of the families dealing with the family members suffering from alcoholism and addiction so they may assist them in obtaining treatment. Two, the psychological trauma and emotional damage alcoholics and addicts and their families experience. Three, the role of the insurance companies and associate providers in their part in the recovery process. Good evening. Welcome to the show. I'm Rick Thompson. This evening's show will address the topic of marijuana and its present place in society and the addictive qualities that it presents in today's youth. Leading into the topic of legalization and the marketing of it, and it's leading to accelerated drug usage. Now this is a subject that I've had personal experience with, which is marijuana usage. I started smoking dope in 1972 at the age of 13. My brother was the person that gave me my first joint, something I definitely did not need. But this sent me into a 20-year nightmare of accelerated drug and alcohol usage, which placed me in a state boys' camp for 10 months, cutting down trees, cross-cutting trees in the middle of winter, middle of winter. Why? Because I was high. I wasn't in reality. I used that to mask my feelings. And along with that came a little alcohol usage and some very bad judgment on my part. Or I stole a car when I was 14, which sent me to the state boys camp, deservedly so. Furthermore, down the road, or further down the road, excuse me, it put me in jails, very bad situations, that got me hurt, got me beaten, and then got me into trouble where I went to federal prison and was on federal probation for six years for stealing mail because I didn't have any money and I was stoned and I needed more money to go get drugs. Down the road, further issues with cocaine. I want to talk about the DEA's position on marijuana. Now, before I go into that, I used marijuana to not feel. I used marijuana as a filter to keep from feeling the pain of my childhood. And by using pot uh, that way, I was creating brain damage. I was creating a, an alter reality that wasn't there. It was a fantasy land. I would listen to rock and roll all day long. And I would fantasize being the drummer or the singer or the guitar player or whatever the heck I was thinking at the time to keep from looking at what was going on with me and keep from looking at how destroyed my life had become. Now that in itself is an an unadulterated nightmare for any kid to have to go through. That led me personally to get into harder drugs And by that, I mean you go from smoking pot to smoking hashish, you start drinking alcohol, and then you find cocaine, and then you really start drinking alcohol because you can stay up for days. And then you end up getting, like it did in my case, white Parkinson's syndrome. Wolf's white Parkinson's syndrome is the correct medical terminology for it. Where you can sit there and do a quarter ounce of cocaine over five days. And then the next time you do a line, you drop dead. There was a kid in the 80s named Len Bias who was on his way to the NBA. He was playing college ball, and this kid was a superstar. He was unreal. Stayed up for days with his buddies. Next day, does a line, goes into immediate heart arrest. They can't bring him out of it. He's gone. It's a miracle that I survived this to say the least. 
DEA's position on marijuana today is marijuana is properly categorized under Schedule I of the Controlled Substances Act. USC 801, the clear weight of the current available evidence supports this classification, including evidence that smoked marijuana has a high potential for abuse. Has no accepted medicinal value in treatment in the United States and evidence that there is a general lack of accepted safety for its use even under medical supervision. The campaign to legitimize what is called medical marijuana is based on two propositions. First, that science views marijuana as medicine, and second, that the DEA targets sick and dying people using the drug. Neither proposition is true. Specifically, smoked marijuana has not withstood the rigors of science. It is not medicine, and it is not safe. Moreover, the DEA targets criminals engaged in the cultivation and trafficking of marijuana, not the sick and dying. Here is their opinion on the fallacy of marijuana for medicinal use. Smoked marijuana is not medicine. In 1970, Congress enacted laws against marijuana based in part on its conclusion that marijuana has no scientifically proven medical value. Likewise, the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, which is responsible for approving drugs as safe and effective medicine, has thus far declined to approve smoked marijuana for any condition or disease. Indeed, the FDA has noted that there is currently sound evidence that smoked marijuana is harmful and that no sound scientific studies support medicinal use of marijuana for treatment in the United States and no animal or human data support the safety or efficiency of a marijuana for general, excuse me, medicinal use. The United States Supreme Court has also declined to carve out an exception for marijuana under the theory of medical viability. In 2001, for example, the Supreme Court decided that a medical necessity defense against prosecution was unavailable to defendants because Congress had purposely placed marijuana into Schedule One status, which enumerates those controlled substances without any medical benefits. Marijuana is the most commonly used illicit drug in the United States. The National Institute on Drug Abuse notes the following recent statistics on marijuana usage in the United States. According to a 2015 national survey, more than 104 million Americans over the age of 12 had tried marijuana at least once, and almost 17 million had used the drug in the month before the survey. The use of marijuana usually peaks in the late teens and early 20s and then declines in later years. Therefore, marijuana use among young people remains a natural concern for parents and the focus of continuing research, particularly regarding its impact on brain development, which continues into a person's early 20s. The potency of marijuana has been increasingly steadily. In 2009, THC concentrations in marijuana averaged close to 10% compared to around 4% in the 80s. In 2008, marijuana was supported in over 374,000 emergency department visits, visits in the U.S., with about 13% involving people between the ages of 12 and 17. Long-term studies of high school students' patterns of drug use show that most young people who use other drugs have tried marijuana, alcohol, or tobacco first. The World Health Organization ranks the United States first among 17 European and North American countries for prevalence of marijuana use. And more users start every day. In 2015, an estimated 2.2 million Americans used marijuana for the first time. Greater than half of the first-time users were under the age of 18. When you look at those numbers, it's a little interesting. It's scary as hell, especially if you've got kids. And every time the kid walks in and he's got red eyes or she's got red eyes, you don't know what they're doing. The domestic arrests for the calendar year of 2014 was 29,612. Now, going from 1986 to 2014, the total was 847,553. Yeah, that's a couple of years. But you've got to figure you've got to add like 3 to 4% a year. So do the math. Seizures of pot by the DEA just in pot alone in 2013 went from 270,000 to 74,000. Now that's interesting when you look at it because it's reduced by over half. Why? Heroin, which is a gateway drug. It's not a gateway drug, but it is a gateway drug because marijuana is a gateway drug. I 
never tried heroin, and I'm going to tell you why. This is a fast story. I'm backstage. I'm with the major act, and one of the band members shoots something into his veins. It was heroin, and he vomits. I'm thinking, I'm never going to get a date like that. So that was the end of that. Okay, now we're back. The offenses from the Federal Bureau of Prisons, the stats, drug offenses, 86,000 people are in. That's 46.5% of the inmates. Now, this is from December of 2015, so it's not even a year old. Federal prison system population actuals. 2014, the total population was 214,149. Net growth of 5,000 people. Now think about that. Do the math on that one. That's pretty scary. You know, it's... Um, when you're doing it, you don't realize what you're doing. You're just trying to run, or you're just having fun. Your, you know, your senses are enhanced when you're stoned. So you think sex is much better on pot than it is when you're not, because when you're young, you really don't know. There is brain damage that happens when you smoke this garbage. I'm living proof of it. Staying stoned altered my reality to where I just got stupid. All my common sense went right out the window. My case, I found the music business thinking that was the fix-all for me on multiple levels. I mean, logically, because my logic was altered. Well, this is a, this, I'm learning a business. I'm making something happen out of thin air. I'm being creative. I'm giving to other people. I can make a lot of money. I can be this person. I can do this. I can do that. It's all complete horseshit because none of that turned out. I did it. I was in it for a long time. I didn't get rich. I didn't become that person I wanted to. Instead, it almost killed me. And it took away an opportunity that was given to me by an attorney that met me when I was 19 years old that was willing to pay for my schooling all the way through law school and would have brought me into his firm. A guaranteed career, guaranteed job. But because of the pot, the dope, the marijuana, I wasn't able to grasp that reality. I wasn't able to grasp any reality because I had none. I had my reality. I had the, mar the, the marijuana reality. That drug did more damage to my life than cocaine, LSD, anything else I involved myself in. And when I see that uh, there is legislation out to legalize pot, I just feel for the youth of America because these poor kids have no clue as to what the hell is going on. So the scam out here in California is you've got a doctor, some scumbag with a medical degree. You walk in and you go, you know, my Schwanstucke uh, got slammed in the door. Whatever. I need some pot to make me f not feel the pain. I've got anxiety. I saw my cat vomit. I'm freaking out. I know that I'm making very light of this, but that's about as ridiculous as it gets. They walk in, they get the script, they pay the, the doctor 60 bucks. They, the doctor makes 60 bucks in five minutes. They take the script next door to the pot store. There you go. Now, the pot that's available today has been genetically altered. The stuff I was smoking when I was a kid had maybe 3% maybe three THC in it. This stuff out here that they've got now, I, I've heard it all the way up to 25 to 30 percent, some high, higher, where these kids are smoking this stuff and they're just going out of their minds. And they keep smoking it and then they get acclimated to it. And then you've got to ask yourself, Jesus Christ. When you hit the wall with that, when you can't go any further with that, what do you do? Where's the next place you're going to go? Well, you're going to go to Coke. And you're going to start drinking. And then you're going to start driving. Why you're on Coke? while you're loaded because I did it thank God I never had a wreck thank God nobody got killed thank God I never got pulled over but just think about that for a minute 
when you put that joint in your mouth, all responsibility goes right out the window, right with your reality. Your senses are deadened. Your concentration is deadened. When I drive on the 405 or the 101 or the 5 or wherever I'm going, I always, this is, I drive like a grandfather now. I get all the way in the right lane at a certain time because I know everybody around me is probably stoned. And you may say, Rick, that's paranoia. It's not paranoia. It's true because if you, as I've driven in California, everybody's lighting up. You can see them in the car blowing joints. You can smell it because, you know, they got the windows rolled down here because we really don't need that much air conditioning. And so there's pot smoke everywhere. It's actually quite scary. Because I see wreck after 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 wreck. You know. And there's, you know, these people that, you know, they don't look like they're drunk, but you can, you know, they look a little confused more than they would since they just had a wreck. And then you ask yourself how many kids, you know, have gotten into wrecks and gotten themselves killed. Because they were stoned. Because they were drunk. How many people have died? You can say, well, this is pretty severe. You know, you're painting a really dark picture, but the, the picture is true. Because it happens. It's scary. I think that any sound legislator would be, uh, well, I think we've got a, a call coming in. Hang on just a second. Hello, you're on the air. Hi, Rick. It's Tim. Well, Tim, how are you? What a pleasant surprise. I'm great. I'm great. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm just doing it solo in the studio and talking about the epidemic of uh, marijuana and its pleasant, present place in society and the addictive qualities that it presents for today's youth. And oh, I'm, man, it, it's a lot different from when I used to smoke it quite a bit back in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. And, uh, you know, now, in those days, when I smoked it, well, I just lost all my motivation. I just, and then, it, it took everything, it stole everything from me. I just lay around and hey, watch I'll, the tube. And keep talking, i got lunch. somebody else calling in. Hey, how you doing, Tony? Is that you? Hang on a second, I've got, I've got Tim on the phone, too. Tim? Well, Tim's here. Tim was here. Tim. I don't know where Tim is, but Tim's here. Okay. Is he smoking? Is he smoking weed? No, hopefully not. He's been sober a long time. <laughs> uh, I maybe he'll call back. I'm ready? Okay. Well, let's. Um, I'll reiterate what I was uh, talking about. Um, this evening's show addresses the topic of marijuana and its present place in society and the addictive qualities that it presents in today's youth and leading into the topic of legalization and the marketing of pot, and it's leading to accelerated drug usage. So uh, what are your thoughts on this, sir? Well, um, I'm always of the mindset that uh, you, can't, you, can't, you, know, you can't legislate morality. So if people want to get high, they're going to get high, and they've been getting high since the beginning of time. I mean, uh -huh. uh, religiously... So anyway, my point is that I I have no objections to people getting high on any substance, really, mm -hmm. as long as it's regulated in the same way that alcohol is regulated or tobacco is regulated. I would be more in favor of a show that begs the people to stop smoking cigarettes and tobacco products than I would anything else. Uh -huh. um, I mean, I think, I don't know, when I remember doing some research into uh, drugs, pot, and what have you, I think... I think there was a total of like 7,000 or 10,000 people in 1993 or 94 who died as a result of, of illegal drugs, um, as opposed to, you know, 150,000 dying as a result of alcohol and almost 400,000 plus dying as a result of cigarettes. So what is the dangerous drug? I don't know. I mean, there are all kinds of, there are all kinds of issues with pot and pills and, and alcohol. I, but, I think that it's just done to scare people. Well, when you do, you know, when you uh, smoked a joint, was your uh, reality altered at all? Oh God, yeah. Okay, so do you think that would be prudent to get behind the wheel of a car when you're stoned? 
No, what I'm saying, you, I, was, I guess I got cut off before. What I'm saying is the same regulations that apply to driving under the influence of alcohol must apply to people driving under the influence of pot. Right. If you get caught, you know, they, they, there's got to be some kind of like they, they have those things you can blow into a tube and they can tell right away, you know, what your your level is on, on booze. I'm sure they have the same thing to know what your level is on right. pot. Uh, and, you know, and then if, you, if you're if you over the limit, uh, whatever that limit might be, you know, you go to jail. Right. You lose your license, all the, whatever, you know, uh, suspension, whatever whatever they do. And, uh, I mean, right now, the rules and regulations regarding alcohol and driving, I mean, I don't think it's strict enough. No, the same thing would be the case with, uh, I mean, if you thought you were going to lose your driver's license forever, <laughs> you know, you like probably, on a second offense, right, you, you wouldn't, wouldn't drink. Yet. Right. One would think. You wouldn't drink and drive. Well, one would think. Or you at least have enough brains to, to hire to hire somebody to and drive. And if, if you do, then you deserve to lose your license. Yeah. That's the regulation. Absolutely. I mean, I don't know what's too punitive, what's not. But I mean, uh, I mean, look, I, I mean, I, I know, and that might sound extreme because all the times I did drugs and, and in addition to drinking, I never once thought about the possibility of going to jail, being caught with, with you know, cocaine or right. whatever in my possession. So I suppose it's, since it's a, it's a, you know, we're we're driven by this uh, this addiction, uh, and we're we don't make decisions that are in our best interest I mean I don't know what else you can do you can continue to make the each each repeated offense have a more serious consequence but you know um, we're we're addicted people we, we're addicted to this stuff our, our body is craving this allergy yeah. of the mind you know um, allergy of the body uh, and what are you going to do? I mean, I don't know if the same thing applies to pot. I don't know if there's a, I don't know if the same kinds of uh, addictive aspects for booze and for cocaine exist in pot. I don't know. I don't mm -hmm. know what the answer is to that. But <laughs> either way. I do, because I, I smoked it for almost 20 years, every day. Yeah, if, you, yeah, if you're... If you're abusing the law, if you're, you're, you're abusing whatever you're abusing and you're driving, uh, then uh, you've got to, uh, you know, there's got to be a price that you have to pay for it. One would think. Simple as that. But they're going to, I mean, the, while the legislation is approving these pot stores for medical marijuana, and you've got these doctors basically right next door to the to pot store, they're charging people, whatever it is, sixty-five bucks for a five-minute, you know, uh, consultation. My knee hurts. You know, I'm drooling. I've got anxiety. I'm freaking out. I can't sleep. And the guy's writing them scripts. You know, and the guys are they're going next door and getting pot brownies or pot or hash or whatever they sell in, in those stores. I've never been in one. And you know, basically, um, they're just giving them license to do whatever they want. And now that all right, but again, it's part it's part of a hypocrisy. Of course, that is like beyond the pale. I mean, if you're an adult and you go into, you know, if you think, oh, you know what, I'm having trouble sleeping, so let me let me like, have a couple of snorts of, of scotch when I go to bed tonight, or you know, some brandy or whatever. I mean, that's the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're an adult and this is what you think you need, then you should be able to make that decision, understanding that whatever you do in the privacy of your own home. It's fine if you want to walk out on the street, and then suddenly we have certain rules and regulations that allow for you know public decorum, and if you violate those rules and regulations, then there should be a price to pay for that. Right. Same thing with pot. You know, to go in and this, this ridiculous hypocrisy. Oh, I got these headaches. Okay, here's a pot script. Oh, I know I hurt my toe. Here's a pot script. It's, it's nonsense. It is nonsense. Uh, but there, but it's obviously happening. somebody's making a lot of money doing that. I'll be at the doctors, the, the the pot stores, or whatever, uh, you know, and it's all part of some gigantic hypocrisy, you know, which goes to prove that, you know, to do it the way we're doing it now is absolutely uh, it's much stupid. insanity is what it is. But these pot the pot stores, yeah. there's a guy that's actually in our uh, program that I met that's one of the largest pot store owners in L.A. and he's he's sober, don't know how. But the, you uh -huh. know, there's somebody that was close to him that had a conversation with him one night, a very candid one, and said, 
how much do you make per store per month? What's your net? And he goes, at least 180000 a month. A wow. month. You know, I mean, that's insane. Well, that's, and obviously that's a business to get into. <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, seriously, it's, you make a fortune doing that. I mean, there are, I've been told that Clippers in Colorado are making anywhere from 75 to a hundred dollars an hour clipping uh buds and i mean mm-hmm. you know this is the, the, for an eight or nine hour shift right you know per hour i mean that's you know nuts and they work these people work seven days a week some to some of them work over i mean it's just there's, there's so much there's such a revenue stream in it that i think if they're going to do this, the feds ought to come in. The DEA should completely control it, and it should be like the old ABC stores when we were kids. Our fathers would have to go to to get uh, in certain states, like in Virginia, where I grew up. My old man would have to go to a state liquor store or North Carolina a state liquor store to get booze. And on Sundays there was blue laws, and you couldn't get that. You'd have to go drive across uh, to, uh, in our case, Maryland, to to uh, to get it. So there's always a way around it. Is the other part. Right. But, but the feds ought to get involved in this thing because, I mean, with the uh, twenty-two trillion dollar, you know, nut we've got hanging over, I mean, they should just uh, sell it, and tax the hell out of it. You know, still yeah, letting the states you get, you get let, still letting the states get the revenue stream from it. You know what? It's going to happen anyway. At some point in time, pretty pretty soon after this conversation, uh, at some point in time, it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. So. So how many people have you known in your life that have uh, had consequences from smoking dope? Or... What is how? I mean, you know, like car wrecks, that kind of thing, uh, getting thrown out of school, losing oh, jobs. I, I don't know. I don't know how many people I know who've had uh, those kind of things as a result of smoking uh, pot. Uh, I know some people who've been arrested because mm-hmm. they've had pot in their possession, well, yeah. but they've had extreme amounts of pot. Right. <laughs> but I know that at a certain point in time in my life growing up, that you don't even need to have that much uh, pot, and you know, to get to get a to get get arrested. And then it became, and they kept changing the rules so that it was based on the amount that you had with you, which would then signify uh, that you were a, a dealer, mm-hmm. uh, Obviously, or you had yeah. intent to distribute. Yeah, you're, you know, you, it's not um, like you have five joints in your pocket; you've got forty pounds in the tr- in the trunk. Yeah, that usually indicates that you're uh, an enterprising young individual. Right. Do you um, do you believe that um, that it that it's used like alcohol to filter our emotional pain and dealing with the circumstances of life? Pardon me. Did you ever or did you ever use pot like alcohol to maybe filter out your emotional pain and dealing with certain circumstances in your life? Did I ever use Yeah, did you ever smoke dope not to feel? Short version. Well, I mean, I think every time I got high, it was I didn't want to feel my feelings. Okay. So, you know, I think that was that was my standard operating procedure for getting high, but I did not want to feel my feelings. Simple as that. I just, I wasn't interested in feeling my feelings. I was escaping, as they say, reality. And, um, you know, that's kind of what I did. Mm-hmm. But, um, <clears throat> but you know that that's that that was me. I mean, I don't know what the case is for other people, but that was definitely my reason for doing it. So when you started off, did you, you was that the first illicit drug you tried was pot? No. Oh, the illicit drug. I, I think yeah, it was or pot. Like a, yeah, sure, oh, it was what, pot. What, but what? I was about eighteen. I was afraid of drugs for the longest time. I mm-hmm. thought, oh, <laughs> you know, what what does it mean? What does it say about me? Then when I did pot, I thought, what the hell was I so afraid of? <clears throat> because it really did not have any kind of effect on me where I I thought, you know, oh, my God, um, you know, I'm, I'm, this is horrible. Uh, I, uh, I just, but it did lead to harder stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like that Bob Dylan lyric. Uh, I started out on Burgundy and soon, soon hit the harder stuff. <laughs> that was what happened to me. You know, mm-hmm. do you think that uh, that that was the gateway drug to go to uh, other drug uh, levels of drug abuse for you, like coke or whatever else you tried? Um, 
yeah, it was definitely, uh, it was definitely a, uh, a um, it was definitely my uh, a gateway drug for me. Pot was okay because <laughs> within within months, not even I'd say within four months of smoking my first joint, I was already experimenting with a, with every drug known to mankind, except you know just sticking needles in my arm. Right. Uh, but you know, but I did. Did snort, you know, heroin and cocaine and stuff like that. But I was always, I was always deathly afraid of needles, uh, you know, as uh, my whole life. But uh, then suddenly I thought, well, you know, uh, what's the big deal, you know? And when that thought came into my head, I said, uh oh, yeah, I got a problem. Right. Yeah, the wheels start coming off when you start rationalizing that. And, hey, this is no big deal. All right, well, we're gonna we're gonna go off for just a second. We're gonna. Be back in just a minute. Okay. To be sober is about willingness, not struggle. If you are willing to be sober, this is a state of great humility. If you are trying to be sober, this is a state of confusion. A willingness to be sober implies you do not know how to do it, but are willing to learn. Trying to be sober implies you should be able to do it, but are struggling with it. Willingness to be sober involves acceptance. Trying to be sober involves condemnation. If you are willing to be sober, you are open to receive. If you are trying to be sober, you are close to guidance. If you have been trying to give up the old ways and condemned yourself of failure to do so, simply be willing to learn how the old ways may be replaced with ways of peace. If you are trying to be sober, you will fear failure. If you are willing to be sober, even failure may be used as a teaching device. If you are trying to be sober, you will fear not being able to be sober. You will judge yourself a failure if you are willing to be sober. No setback becomes a problem, for you know where you'll be shown. If you are trying, you are attempting to be sober by yourself. If you are willing to be sober, you are asking for guidance. Trying to be sober places the responsibility on you. Being willing to be sober places the responsibility on God. Willing to be sober is, in a sense, a prayer. Trying to be sober is an act of separation from your higher power. When you try, there is resistance. When you become willing, there is acceptance. If you are trying to be sober, everything is interference. If you are willing to be sober, everything is of assistance. The free choice to be sober is the most important decision you make each day because it speaks for your willingness to be sober each day. Sobriety is a voluntary restraint from indulging in a desire or appetite for certain bodily activities that are widely experienced as giving pleasure. Not engaging in the problematic behavior connotes increased self-control and the hope of improved social interactions and personal health as a consequence. The website for Life Repair Recovery Talk Radio is www.latalkradio.com. Life Repair Recovery Talk Radio is on Channel 1. We are broadcasting live from our studios each and every Sunday at 6 p.m. West Coast time. All of our shows are archived on the www.latalkradio.com site and can be accessed 24-7. Our call in number to the studio during the show is 323-203-0815. That's 323-203-0815. And now back to our show. I would like to take a moment and talk to you about the Villa Treatment Center. Their integrated substance abuse and dual diagnosis program rests on foundational principles of personal responsibility, structure, and service. Whether you are at the beginning of your recovery journey or farther along the road, the Villa Treatment Center offers an individual plan to suit all of your recovery needs. Detoxification by doctors specializing in addiction medicine, residential treatment, transitional living, day treatment, and full care outpatient services are available. Please call 818-505-6900 for further information. That's 818-505-6900 and begin your recovery now. And we're back. How you doing, Tony? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm okay. All right. We're back. We're talking about... The Trials and Tribulations of Smoking Pot, Today's World, which is the short version of uh, okay. the topic of legalization and the marketing of it. Do you anticipate in the near future that uh, these companies that are going to be mass producing grass in cigarette form are going to be like you know, the uh, tobacco uh, or cigarette commercials of old that we grew up with? Uh -huh. Do you think that's going to happen? Do you think you'll turn on your television set and you'll see a advertisement for uh, weed? <laughs> no, I don't, I, don't, I don't think you'll see an advertisement. You'll, 
I mean, you may see in print ads. Possibly, you may like see that. you may see ads like they like you know the whole another hypocrisy is you see these ads for for beer and for different kinds of alcohol on television, but the whole thing is that the people in the ad can't drink the actual substance in front of them. Right. You know, that, you know. Again, it's like, oh, this is the hypocrisy we all agreed to. And if I had a company that was uh, that was making, you know, some kind of a, a beverage, uh, alcoholic beverage, I'd agree to it too. If that was the only way I can get my stuff advertised out there, I'd figure out how to make the ad attractive and interesting. You know, if my people watching the ad couldn't drink, I'd say, okay, I get it. Not not a big deal. Um, but uh, you know, I, whether you will see the same commercial for pot. I don't. I don't know. Um, I don't know if that'll be the case because it might be too. I don't know. It's really kind of difficult. But then again, what's the difference between having a Miller beer or a Bud yeah, Light? Right. Or, exactly. You know, I mean, you like beer. You like beer. And if you if you if you wanted to have a beer and you're say you're 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 an alcoholic, at the end of the day. You're not going to say, oh, no, no, I can't drink. I, I usually like Miller Lite, so I'm not going to have this other stuff. <laughs> you know, you don't care. Right. Of course not. Uh, there's some people who, who, are, who have, have a, a taste for a particular, like the white people like Coca-Cola versus Pepsi-Cola. You know, there's some people who really tell you there's a difference. I don't, you know, I don't know. I, I was... don't know. I'm not that into that, 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 that beverage to know the difference. <laughs> Right, but I accept that there are people who do. Yeah, well, I'm, you know, I was wondering, you know, the other the other day when I was thinking about doing this show, I said, I wonder how many people have already got domain names held that are just waiting for this so they can sell them. Oh, I'm sure there are thousands. You know, I mean, every possible name that you can name a pack of of joints. You know, every, every possible name that you could name your product that has marijuana in it has probably already got to be snatched up. Just to, just that market alone, my God, someone that doesn't even smoke dope probably got smart enough and went, right. okay, I see this coming down the horizon, you know, and they sat there for and probably hired a think tank of people to make up shit that, they would, that could be slapped on a cart. All right. It's amazing. So... How many people do you, um, without obviously no names, is in your industry, is is marijuana usage uh, prevalent? To tell you the truth, I wouldn't know. I, uh, I you know, I, I've lost, you know, when I used to do pot or when I, I mean, when I used to snort her, um, cocaine, you know, and I would leave. I mean, I didn't work, I didn't do any drug whatsoever when I was on the job. <laughs> but, uh, so, leaving the set to go snort cocaine or smoke a joint, I don't know. I don't know who does that. I don't pay attention to it anymore. Right. Uh, you know, if somebody says, excuse me, i got to go to the bathroom, I can take them at their work or they got to go take a, right. take a leak. Right. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that they're going in there to snort cocaine. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, and again, like I said, if, if I'm on a set <laughs> and somebody's doing it, I am not, I don't see it. I, I'm not that like hep, I'm not hep to that, sh that stuff anymore. Mm -hmm. um, maybe one point I was, but I'm not anymore. I really am not. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So I just kind of, uh, you know, I, I'm sort of a nerd now when it comes to that stuff. I would never known you as a nerd. Well, I mean, That's the thing insane. is, I don't. Know. I really don't know. What do you think that uh, on on treatment and outreach in, in the schools? What, what do you think that there should be people out there uh, making attempts to school these children on the uh, the realities of smoking pot? You can have a, you can have a room in the in school, any school, and I think it would be a reasonable expenditure of funds that every school in America has, like you know, so like they have guidance counselors. If somebody to sort of, if you need to talk to somebody about drug abuse, mm -hmm. it's somebody to do that. <clears throat> whether to have, you know, this whole big friggin', uh, you know, like a giant program with, you know, all these, I don't think you're going to get people. I mean, I wouldn't, when I was first starting to do drugs, I was not in a million trillion years where I'd gone to some, to some, uh, um, 
to some counselor to talk about it, I would have been too afraid of being busted. You know, I would have been right. too afraid of somebody contacting my parents or whatever. So it would have, it would have definitely stayed uh, hidden. I mean, you know, uh, that's that's what what happened. Um, well, there definitely should be some preventive education and treatment and outreach programs uh, for this for these when these kids are that young, because they're getting high at ten now, nine, and you have to hit them at the uh, elementary school level, and uh, you know the, the funding needs to be increased to do this, and, and the feds I think have, and even the states have even dropped the ball on this, That's because this is just as much of an epidemic, if not worse, than heroin, because it leads into heroin sooner or later. A kid that's smoking dope. He's going to try secondals, two and alls. He's going to, you know, try uh, blow. He's going to do that for a while. He's going to drink while he's doing all of that, and then one day, you know, he's he's going to try opioids, and then you know the the wheels completely fall off. And um, right. you know, they, there should be more drug court programs for treatment and, and IOP aftercare treatment instead of incarcerating these people. For, you know, well, that part of it, I agree. <laughs> that part of it, that, that would be money well spent. If they could have a uh, some sort of a program, um, initially, I guess, out, outpatient program, person gets arrested mm -hmm. uh, for driving uh, under the influence, um, you know, just like with alcohol, uh, there definitely has to be some kind of, uh, you know, uh, place that they can go to to discuss mandatory mm -hmm. you know mandatory that they go to this place to discuss their their issues with this stuff and realize you know because if they're so stupid it's like i have been on occasion when i used to drink and drive um you know that they're going to drive their cars under the influence of pot or under the influence of alcohol they definitely should have uh <clears throat> they should definitely have you know some kind of things they must attend or go to prison Right, so it's, it's like traffic school, forever, except whatever. it's called like pot school or something like that. Which yeah, you know, well, well, it's like you know they have yeah they have. I know that there are people who get busted for dri driving uh, under the influence, and then they have to go to uh, Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, right? And after meeting, sure, you know, or ninety meetings, and right. then they bring that card into the to the judge or the judge probation officer and have or to show that whatever. They're whatever place you have to continue to report to and and you tell them hey this is what uh you know this is what happened and they go okay <clears throat> and you know then they hopefully you won't do it again and but if you're if you're truly addicted if you if you're truly addicted to a particular substance or you're like an alcoholic you're going to you're going to continue to do it again until you finally decide the, to, until you hit the wall get, right get over you right. get clean and sober. Right. And so, if you and, you you know, and I can do it, anybody can do sober, it. Sober, you don't have a shot. What? But they're not going to do it until they hit the wall, because nobody does it until they hit the wall, until they painted themselves into a corner so irrevocably they can't get out of it. You know? And that's right. what it takes for people like us, because that's how we're wired. You know, it's just uh, it's unbelievable. <laughs> I'm just really surprised yeah. that even with the, with this administration that's been in for eight years, how little has been done to deal with this pot issue, that he hasn't stepped in and done something. Uh, you know, and to make it proactive to where the government can make tax revenue off of it and control it overall. And, um, you know, just uh, that's very disheartening on a lot of levels. But, um, but. yeah. So I, I agree. I agree. Well, you know that all that all may change I mean, in a few days, one way or the other. That's they they sure. just go about it the wrong way. I mean, you know, they don't know. Like every time, you know, it's like like some of these people that are appointed, like com, you know, commissioners of of drugs and stuff like that, and and then you know, you get to meet them. I mean, they might as well be wearing like you know. Uh, White socks with a black suit or something. I mean, right. they're so they're so square. <laughs> yeah, right. They they <laughs> can't know? wrap their head around it I mean, because they don't understand the animal. Right. And they start appointing people who actually are former alcoholics or addicts mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Right. And uh, you know, or had like several several years in in counseling and drug addiction and and, and, and substance abuse. Until that point, it's going to be meaningless programs they're going to put together. They're just going to put they're going to constantly put band aids on a saber wound. 
yeah, you know right and you, you, people have got to get to the place where they accept the fact that uh, this is an addiction this is, this is not something for somebody to be incarcerated about this is not something for somebody to go to jail for like you know forever about this is about uh, you know being told I mean look I, I would be I would be in agreement to saying to somebody hey you know what uh, this is your second offense you're going away to a treatment facility. So let's do it. Right. You that, or you go away to jail. You decide, buddy. What do you want to do? Yeah. You know, the person might say, "Well, you know, I'll go." They think they might be pulling one over on everybody. Right. But if they'll go away to something like that, and if they do, <clears throat> excuse me, the possibility exists that they can really get some serious help. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, if there's a a third round where they say, okay, look, even after doing this, if you decide to go out again and you get caught, you know, you, just, you decide to drink and drive again, well, then maybe there should be some jail time. I mean, I don't know. Well, there should be some jail time. I mean, there's got to be some punishment because if there's no punishment, then there's no consequences, period. Right. I think, yeah, if you, if you get caught, you get caught drinking and driving, okay, uh, there is a, clearly a... Uh, there's a risk element involved, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, it'll you'll be able to uh, hopefully you'll be able to to come up with a system where the person will definitely decide <laughs> they need help. Yep, <clears throat> and uh, you know, and and take that route. But the people who don't, then they go to jail. They go to jail. It's like if you if you're drinking and driving. And you kill somebody, and you're behind the wheel. I mean, okay, you could say it's the addiction, it's you know, the, the whatever. Right. You know, um, that's really a shame. God Almighty, I feel so bad for this person. But you know, the person, the other person's family is in, in ruin, as well true. as the person who was driving the vehicle. <laughs> but somebody has to take responsibility. That's true, Tony. I thank you for calling in. We're running out of time here, and uh, hopefully, we'll be able to get you back on the show very soon. Okay, I look forward to it. Thanks, buddy. Have a good night. You too. Bye-bye. We're at the end of this week's show, but make sure to tune in next week. Our mission is to provide a safe platform for those who are still suffering from various forms of addiction. I'm just a guy willing to listen and offer suggestions to help those in crises. We leave you now with some words of wisdom from the late, great John Flynn, who is... In my heart, and it was a very good man. Disappointment. Disappointment is the caboose on the toots and train of expectation. Anything you want from anybody, you give them what you want from them. It's the only way you're going to get it. Life is about giving, not getting. Day at a time. Thank you, John. Thanks for listening. It's always a pleasure to serve you. Good night and good luck. You're listening to Life Repair Recovery Talk Radio with Rick Thompson only on L.A. Talk Radio.